Okay, so thank you to everyone attending. Um, so this is our annual research update. It's definitely looking a little different than last year as we can't see your guys' wonderful faces this year. Um, so yeah, we're gonna begin. So our vision at Lara is to be a leader in applied agricultural research and extension in Alberta. Um, our mission is to conduct innovative, unbiased, applied agricultural research and extension supporting sustainable agriculture. So what this means is we are able to provide unbiased research. So when we put plots in the ground, we don't really care what variety it is, what any of the stuff is, as long as at the end of the day it grows and we can collect data off of it, that's all we care. We don't wanna specifically point varieties to people. So all of our data that we collect is unbiased. Our data is local as we do all of our data analysis and growing of our research um, within our four municipalities. And it's all applied agricultural information. So at the end of the day, you can take this information home to your, um, your farm industry and share it with other people. And hopefully it helps you make on-farm decisions. So as said before, we do um, run in four municipalities. So we are in partnership with the County of St. Paul, MD of Bonneville, Lac La Biche County and Smoky Lake County. We are located, our main office is in Fort Kent, Alberta. So in the MD of Bonneville. Within our four municipalities, we reach over 2,100 farms and within the four municipalities over 1.9 million acres. So we have a fair large amount of um, land and producers to reach within our municipalities. So the structure of our organization, so it starts with the producers. So our producers are our reps as we are a producer driven organization. So each municipality brings two producer reps to our board and we also have a, um, a county rep. So each county brings one counselor and an alternative to our alternate to our board. Sorry. Um, so within those, we have a vice chair. So Luke Tellier is our vice chair. He's also our producer rep from Lakeland Forge Association. Wanda Austin was our chair of the board in 2020, and she is also a producer rep from Lacklebish County. And Murray Scott was our secretary treasurer. So he's also a producer rep from the ND of Bonneville. So us as Alara staff work underneath all of you guys, essentially. So that is how our organizational structure is at Lara. For our board, um, as Wanda said before, from the County of St. Paul, we had Carl Agnemart, Phil Amiet, Cliff Martin, and Kevin Worsta. Lacklebish County, we had Wanda Austin, Laurier, Barasa, George LaRue, and Colette Borgen. The MD of Bonneville, we had Alf Hurd, Murray Scott, Mark Jubinville, and Mike Kriviak. And for the County of Smoky Lake, we had Barb Shapka, Charlie Leskew, Dan Gualco, and Johnny Chernichen. So I wanna thank you guys again for being on our board in 2020. We truly appreciate all the help that you guys give us and guidance, and we are looking forward to another year. So at Lara, we also have seven staff members. So Alyssa Krawchuk, she is our ma main manager and forage and livestock specialist. So she is currently on maternity leave um, and she should be back in July. So we're really looking forward to having her back. And hopefully with lots of pictures of the baby, we're pretty excited to see her. Um, below her is Dustin Roth. He is our part-time research technician and also our handyman. He fixes anything and always is at the office within a phone call. Um, above him is myself, Amanda Mathiot. I am the intern manager and cropping program coordinator. Below me is Kelly Nichaporek. She's our environmental program manager. So she deals with all of the EFP and um, helping assist with CAP grant applications. Above her is Stephanie Billado. She is our agronomy technician. So she um, helps within all of the programs. Um, below her is, you can see the two figurines. So below is 
Charlene Ruchinski. She is our horticultural program coordinator and she is also our financial person. So she does our payroll and takes care of the garden. And above her is Vic Sudlowski. So he's our field technician. He helps assist Charlene with the horticultural program and he keeps everyone light at the office as he's always playing jokes on us. So for our research trials and demonstrations, in 2020, we had 32 research trials, which contained over 2,100 um, small plots. So it was definitely a large amount of plots. That's the largest amount we have ever done here at Larith. Um, so these were spread across all four municipalities. Unfortunately, two of our municipalities did claim an agricultural um, disaster. So the County of Smoky Lake and Lac La Biche County both had extreme amounts of precipitation. So our trials didn't do very well in these counties, um, but we still did receive some data off of them. So um, when, at the end of the week, we will have our annual report on our website and you guys can see all of the data from these trials. We also had five projects. So that was the RAP project um, from Kelly's environmental program. We had the Rancher Research, Cover Crops and Soil Health, Soil Benchmarking, and a Winter Grazing and Soil Health project. So those kept us um, very busy as well. We had two demonstration trials. So we had a wheat demonstration in Lac La Biche, and we also had a fall hybrid um, rye here at Lara. And our staff also conducted three insect surveys. So it was a fairly busy year here at Lara. Um, for extensions, even with COVID, we were able to host 18 extension events. Some were in person. So all of our summer field days were in person. Of course, with COVID restrictions being in place, we did have um, safety measures put into practice. So within these 18 events, we um, reached over 980 producers. We would have reached more um, if it was a typical year, but because of COVID, we didn't hold as many events as we were hoping, as we did have to cancel three of our extension events. Um, we also have Kelly, so she is our zone eight coordinator for our classroom ag agricultural program. Um, unfortunately, that was canceled as well due to COVID. So there is a lot of students that were unable to get this program, which is really sad. There were 23 environmental farm plans completed. So this was within all four municipalities. Um, Kelly assisted 45 producers with CAP grant applications. 24 producers utilized the RAP program. And we sent out eight newsletters to over 21 farm mailboxes. We also helped over 50 producers with one-on-one -on -one phone calls in 2020. Um, we helped over 70 producers with feed sampling and testing. So we sent in over 140 feed samples for producers. And we also helped three producers with their age verification. Um, so it was, even though we did have COVID, it was still a fairly busy year between all of our plots and our extension events. So here is all of our small plot equipment. So the top left corner is our forage harvester. So we use this um, to collect all of our um, forage from our regional silage trials and other silage trials here at Lara. Um, the picture right next to it on the right is our small plot seeder. So our small plot seeder is only, when it seeds in the row, it's only 1.15 meters wide. So it's not very wide. We have five rows with nine inch spacings. So it's fairly small. Um, next to it on the right is our brand new plot combine. So this we received in July, we were extremely excited to use it. Um, it definitely threshes a lot better than our old combine did. Um, we are very grateful that we did hang on to our combine though, as this one did break down partway through harvest. So we are very happy that we did have our old combine in place as we finished off harvest with the old one. Um, and below is our small plot sprayer. So it's not very big, but it gets the job done. So this here is our small plot random, randomization. So this is our um, block design. So as you can see, there's 
four rows. So those are our rep repetitions. Um, so within that, so on here, you can see there is 14 um, different boxes with two guards on each end. And what we do when we get our um, varieties is we put them into a program and we randomize it. So what it does is you'll still have the 14 varieties, but they're randomized throughout the four different reps so that it creates um, a more natural, um, I guess, flow. So say if the Northeast side gets drowned out, there's still a good possibility that you'll still have good data collected throughout and be able to use it. Hopefully you guys understood that. If not, phone me, we can have a good conversation about it. Um, so what you'll see in the graphs when we get to the um, data is you'll see we'll have varieties, the um, bushels per acre, and then you'll see some of them have this yield grouping. So what this yield grouping is, is it assigns each variety um, a grouping. So it could be A, B, C, um, and we use it to determine if the varieties have a significant difference. So as you can see, AC Metcalf and Conrad are both BCs. So they, um, they are significantly close together where you can see CDC Cowboy is an A and CB is an E. So you can see that there is a significant difference um, between the varieties. So as you can see, the significant difference in this case would be the yield. So CDC Cowboy yielded 84.2 bushels per acre and CB yielded 46.7 bushels per acre. So it pretty much just tells you um, what the significant difference is and if there are um, varieties that are very close or similar. You can also see at the bottom of the variety, um, there is this CV equals 11.28. So CV is coefficient of variable. So pretty much it measures the consistency of the trial. So the lower the number, the more reliable the data is. So if, you if we have a CV below 20, um, that is considered accept acceptable data and it is very sound. If the CV is above 20, um, it means that the data is statistically unsound and it is um, not very good. So we wouldn't, um, we wouldn't really show it. Well, we'd show it, but we wouldn't um, advise producers to use that data. So we're gonna dig into the RVTs. Um, so, and, uh, yes. I have a question before you move on there. For sure. So the varieties, is that barley that you had seeded there? Um, so this is just an example. Um, so like on the so on this side slide right here, Mark, you're talking. Yes, yes. So this isn't any of our data here at Lara. We just use this as an example. I um, see. Yeah, to show um, when we get into the graphs what um, like coefficient uh, variable means and what the yield groupings mean. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I should have explained that. You just you just did. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so yeah, getting into the RVTs. So we are going to start with the wheat. Um, so this year, um, we had two different wheat trials. So we had our CWRS, um, which was also paired with the CWHWS. So the first one is going to be the Canadian Western Red Spring Wheat. Um, and there is also Canadian Western Hard White Spring Wheat in the first category. So that's going to be the first set of trials that I show. And then the second set of trials of wheat, we have the CPSR and the CWSP. So what that is, is the Canadian Prairie Red or Spring Red and the Canadian Western Special Purpose. So that'll be our second um, category of wheat trials that we did this year. So this here is our um, CWRS trials that we seeded in Malag this year. There were 32 varieties within this trial. Um, these were planted on May 24th of 2020 um, using 330 plants per meter square for our seeding rate. Um, we put this down with 125 pounds 
of fertilizer. So our blend was 30 or 60, 30, 25, 10. Um, and we also had 279 millimeters of rain from the start of um, the growing period till harvest. Um, so as you can see, the top yielding was PT652 at 77 bushels per acre. Um, following below it was SY Gabrio at 75 bushels per acre. Um, so in reality, looking at the yields, these ones were fairly um, close within the actual 32 varieties. Um, they did fairly well. Um, as you can see at the top, there is a percent of AAC Brandon and percent of Carberry. So what that is, is it's comparing these two varieties um, to the varieties within the entire trial as Brandon and Carberry are two very typical grown um, wheats in our area. So they use that as a comparison so you can see. Um, overall, these trials did fairly well. We were quite impressed with them. So this one here is the CWRS wheat in Fort Kent. Um, the top yielding was AAC Russell at 78 bushels per acre. So that is 134% um, of Brandon and 140% of Carberry. Um, so that also did fairly well. Um, within the top 10, PT625 was one of the varieties that we've seen quite common. Um, yeah, these ones are very interesting. Um, if you guys did come to our field tours in Maleg and Fort Kent, um, you would have seen these varieties firsthand. They did very well in standability. I was quite impressed, especially with all the environmental conditions that we did have throughout the year. Um, they stood very well. Um, so these ones in um, Fort Kent um, did well. We had a lot more wind and rain, um, but yeah, they did good. So I'm gonna move on to the CPSR um, category. So this one here was a lot smaller. We had 11 varieties in this trial. So Fort Kent was seeded on May 15th and we harvested the trial on September 29th. Um, so the top yielding in Fort Kent was WPB Whistler at 74 bushels per acre. Um, it did fairly well in capacity. Um, so compared to Carberry and Brandon, um, it did fairly well as those were the two lowest yielding varieties. Um, the Maleg CPSR wheat was seeded on May 24th and we harvested it on October 2nd. So it was a little bit later seeded, but also taken off a little bit later. So as you can see um, within the top five, AAC Castle and WPB Whistler made the top um, five for both sites. And as you can see, our CV was fairly low. So this data is very accurate and stable. Um, so it, it's good. Um, in Fort Kent, we averaged about uh, 10.9 on our protein for this wheat. And in Maleg, we averaged 10.7. So they were fairly um, decent in the protein category. Um, so we were fairly impressed with the wheat. So we're gonna move on to the barley. So in 2020, there was 21 varieties of barley. Um, so again, these varieties are from all different um, seed companies. Uh, they put them into these trials. So the Maleg, um, the Maleg barley was seeded on May 24th and harvested on October 2nd. And the Fort Kent barley was seeded on May 15th and harvested on the 29th. Um, they did fairly well. Um, lodging wasn't really an issue this year, which was quite surprising again, due to our environmental factors. Um, the top yielding, um, as you can see in Fort Kent was AB Advantage. So at 103 bushels per acre, AB Advantage is one of the newer varieties out there. Um, Lots of people like feedlot wise have been liking it for feed for their livestock. 
Um, so yeah. And then Maleg, um, CWS coral was the top yielding at 126 bushels per acre. Um, straw length wise, they weren't horrible this year. Um, then again, as there wasn't too terribly much lodging. Um, so now we have triticale. So there was four varieties of triticale grown. Um, triticale, typically we haven't seen too much of it in our municipalities. Um, there is quite a bit of interest in it. I have talked to a couple of producers who are maybe interested in getting into that niche market. Um, so we had four varieties in this trial. Um, the Fort Kent was seeded on May 15th and harvested on September 30th. And the Malag varieties were seeded on May 24th and harvested on October 2nd. So we seeded these at a um, plants per meter square of 310 plants per meter square. Um, and as you can see within both Fort Kent and Malag, the top um, two varieties um, well, I guess the variety that is in the top two in both categories is T256. Um, it did very well in both Maleg and Fort Kent. Um, in general, the straw length wasn't too horrible. Um, Fort Kent, we averaged a straw length or height of 98 centimeters. And in Maleg, we averaged um, a height of 106, which is fairly good because triticale is typically one of the taller varieties of cereals. Um, we also had oats this year in our RVT trial. Um, unfortunately, our oat trial in Lac La Biche got flooded out. Um, so we only have the data from the one that is in the Fort Kent um, field that we had this year. So this was seeded on May 25th of 2020 at 300 plants per meter square. We harvested it at, on September 30th. Um, overall, the harvest went fairly well on this. Um, we did have the seven varieties, as you can see in this trial. The highest yielding variety was CDC Endure at 191 bushels per acre. So that surpassed its check of CDC Dancer by quite a bit. Um, this variety was followed by AC Morgan at 162 bushels per acre. Um, so definitely with the environmental conditions that we had, I was quite impressed with the oats as oats is usually one of the um, cereal varieties that lodges quite easily. And they actually were fairly good when it came to combining for lodging. So I was very impressed with the oats. Um, so here we have our green and yellow peas. So these we grew in the county of St. Paul. Um, we had six varieties of green peas. Um, so they averaged in general 46 bushels per acre. Um, both the green and yellow peas were planted on May 12th and we harvested them on October 8th. Um, so as you can see, AAC Comfort um, was the highest yielding green pea at 51 bushels per acre. So that surpasses its um, check of CDC spruce by 13%. Um, height wise, they did fairly well. Um, they averaged about 84 centimeters, the green peas. The yellow peas did fairly well as well. Um, you can see we had a larger amount of yellow peas than green. Um, so um, yeah, they, they did good. We had CDC Inca at 56 bushels per acre. So that was our top yielding yellow pea, um, which surpasses Czech CDC spruce by a fair bit. Um, yeah. So overall the yellow peas, or overall the peas did very good. They stood well this year and they did very well considering the amount of moisture that we had. Um, I was very concerned that we might have some uh, disease pressure, but we were very fortunate that we um, didn't get any diseases within the peas. This is probably one of the RBTs that I was most excited about. Um, from my start of time here at Lara, I have never seen faba beans harvested. So this was the first time that we harvested faba beans. Um, so they were seeded on May 12th. 
we seeded them at 44 plants per meter square. Um, we used fertilizer of 50 pounds per acre of 1152, and they were harvested on October 8th of 2020. So I was very excited because I've never seen faba beans harvested. Um, it was definitely a lot easier harvesting than what I thought it would be. They um, fed well into the combine, they came out fairly clean. Um, so I was very impressed with them. Um, as you can see, Fabel was the highest yielding at 50, 50, 55 bushels per acre. Um, so it did fairly well. It was 19% above the check of Snowbird. Um, th the average bushel per acre from these varieties was uh, 46 bushels per acre, sorry. Um, so yeah, I was very excited. They did well. The data is very accurate as it had a really low CV of 6.6. .6. So yeah, I'm, I was really excited about them and I'm hoping in 2021 they grow just as well and we can harvest them. So the next trials that I want to uh, show you guys are our environmentally smart nitrogen trials. So we use these on spring cereals. These trials were seeded in the County of St. Paul and Smoky Lake County. Unfortunately, our trial in Smoky Lake County did get flooded out. Um, it, we were unable to harvest it due to immature plants, um, just due to the flooding. Um, so environmentally, Smart nitrogen is a slow releasing nitrogen. So it has a polymer coat that protects against denitrification, volatilization, and leaching. So this coating allows water to enter into the granular um, and it creates like a liquid solution. So depending on soil temperature and the needs of the plant, um, this solution can move out of the M <laughs> out of the membrane and um, be utilized by the plant. So yeah, it's uh, fairly cool. So I would like to thank Top Grow Agro out of Maleg. They supplied us with the environmentally smart nitrogen for this project. Um, so th these trials are one of our sets of trials through the Canadian Agricultural Partnership through um, the government of Alberta. Um, so we still have this trial for a couple more years. So we're excited to continue the data off of these trials. Um, so for these trials, we used AAC Brandon wheat for the wheat portion, and we used Metcalf barley for the barley. So we used a seeding rate of 330 plants per meter square for the barley and 270 plants per meter square or sorry, 330 plants per meter square for the wheat and 270 plants per meter square for the barley. So these trials were seeded on May 28th, 2020, and we harvested them on October 22nd. So we had four different treatments in a check. So we had 30% ESN, 30%, or 50%, 70%, and 90% ESN. And then we also had a check. So our check was just a regular uh, blend of fertilizer just to compare to the ESN. Um, so Top Grow was really good. They took our um, soil samples, they created the blend for us. So it's basically based off of the same fertilizer that was used for the rest of our um, RVT trials. Um, so they used that when creating the blends for the ESN. Um, so as you can see, within both the wheat and the barley, um, ESN at 30% was the highest yielding for both of them, followed by 90% ESN. Um, and within the data from last year too, it was fairly similar um, when it came to the percents of ESN used and yield correlation. Um, so in the barley, um, ESN at 30% was the highest yielding at 94 bushels per acre. So it was just a little bit higher than the 90, um, as you can see from the check where the ESN barley at 30% was 112% of the check and the ESN barley at 90 was 111. So in the barley trials, 30% did quite a bit better than the 90%. Um, in the wheat, um, you can see again, 
ESN at 30% was the highest yielding at 54 bushels per acre. So it was 22% higher than the check. And ESN um, at 90% um, was second at 51 bushels per acre. Um, when it came to protein, 70% um, ESN um, was the highest at 11.45% protein on the wheat. Um, yeah, I don't know, fair, I was fairly impressed with these trials. Um, hopefully next year we will be able to collect the data from the Smoky Lake um, portion of this trial as we're praying our environmental conditions are a lot better. Um, and yeah, so we'll see. But um, overall, we are very impressed with these trials. Considering um, the environmental conditions throughout all of our municipalities, we had fairly stable, stable CVs. Um, also this year, we did grow quinoa again. Um, we've grown it for a couple of years. It's definitely a very interesting crop to grow. As you can see from the middle picture, the crop itself um, in its adolescent stage looks like lamb's quarter. Um, we've had many producers stop by and ask us why we're growing patches of weeds, but after explaining to them what it is, they're quite interested. Um, so, as we've repeated in previous AGMs and um, different tours, quinoa has a very high insect pressure. So this is one of those crops that you can't go fishing for the weekend or go take a week long trip to the lake. Um, it has to be scouted at least three to four times a week as insect pressure is insane. Um, anything that likes canola will attack your quinoa first. Um, this year, we were very fortunate. Our insect pressure hasn't been as high as the past two years. Um, this year, I only sprayed three times with insecticide. Um, in previous years, we've sprayed, I want to say, six to nine times for insecticide. So the insects really um, like this crop. Um, but it's, um, I don't know, it's, it's a really cool crop to grow. Um, but yeah, it's very labor intensive. <laughs> We also conducted three um, insect surveys. So our Bertha armyworms, we conducted these in the MD of Bonneville, Lac La Biche County and St. Paul County. Um, looking at all of the data that was collected from these, um, these pest surveys, we are very well below um, the first level of warning. So in birth armyworms, when we collect over 300 um, adult moths in a trap, um, we hit that first level of warning saying that there is concern um, the previous year or the next year we could have um, an increased number. Um, but we were fairly low. I believe the highest we hit this year um, between all four or all three counties was like 115 moths at the highest peak. Um, so there really isn't too much a concern of a concern of the birth of army worms, but we still do recommend that producers keep an eye out and scout their fields. We also um, conducted the diamondback moth um, pest surveys. So this was in the MD of Bonneville. Um, so we also use a pheromone trap to um, entice the insects into the traps. Um, we had very low numbers again this year. Um, we didn't even hit the first warning level, um, which is about a hundred um, insects per trap. Um, we didn't even get anywhere as close to that. Um, this insect though is very hard to predict as it varies on population size in the spring. Um, so even though we are conducting this survey, it's not always a guarantee that we know whether we're going to have a high population or not in the spring. We also conducted wheat midge surveys. So um, these we did in Lac La Biche, the MD of Bonneville and St. Paul County. Um, so we went and took soil samples as we were looking for the eggs. Um, Again, we had very low number, low numbers, um, and it doesn't seem like there is going to be too much of a concern of them for 2021. Um, but yet again, diligence, and we got to keep our eyes out. Um, we have seen 
an increase though in our counties of the key leaf weevil. Um, in 2021, we are going to be doing a survey for the pea leaf weevil. Um, it's been requested by the government of Alberta. They've asked us if we wanted to do it as there has been an increased number. So for producers in our four municipalities, um, just keep an eye out if you see little notches in your pea leaves or in your faba beans, um, it's most likely a pea leaf weevil. So if you guys do need identification, um, give us a call or your local agronomist and anyone be, would be willing to help you guys. So a glance at uh, 2021, we are gonna be continuing with our local cereal variety trials. Um, so this trial we put on every year. So it's for our producers within our four municipalities. If there's a certain variety um, of cereal that you guys would like to see that you are very interested in growing, please let us know and we will try and source it and put it into these trials. Um, it's very nice to get you guys' feedback and see what you guys are always interested in. We do have another Canadian Agricultural Partnership um, trial. So this is our canola seed size versus seeding depth trial. Um, this is gonna go into Lac -La Biche again this year. Unfortunately, with the environmental conditions, this trial did very poor. Um, but we are looking forward to doing it again next year and collecting hopefully very um, consistent data off of this trial. <laughs> We're going to be conducting our cover crop demonstration. So this is um, using different varieties of cover crops. We have a little demo that's going to be at the back of our Lara office. Um, so we're going to be demonstrating different blends. Um, we're also going to be conducting our pulse cereal mix mixtures. So this is our original silage trial um, pulse and cereal mixtures. Um, Stephanie will be touching base on that here right away. But we're really excited to be trying that again this year. Um, it's very interesting, especially if you are a cattle producer, uh, some of the benefits that it can have for your cattle and feed. And our last thing we're fairly excited about, we have applied for a hemp license. Um, we're just finishing the process up here. So within this week, we should have everything um, sent in. So we're very hopeful that we are going to be growing hemp in 2021. So we are really excited about that. Um, yeah, so that's all that I have for my presentation. Is there any questions? Hi, Amanda, Charlie. Yes, uh, you are still publishing the paper annual report, right? Yes, we will. So um, right now we're putting it up on our uh, website. And once we have the copies in our hands, we will be delivering them to all the county offices and also to the local seed cleaning plants. So um, if you can't find them there, you can also give us a phone call and we will try and get one to you. Okay, thank you. Amanda, Mark here, one question. Yeah, for sure. Out of your 2,100 lots or plots, yeah. how are they divided uh, between the municipalities? Do you know offhand? Uh, not off the top of my head. I could definitely figure out that number and get those to each municipality if you'd like. Or I could actually bring those numbers to the board meeting and the councillors can bring them back to their municipalities. Yeah, that'd be if good. That, that works for you guys? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Amanda, you would have the most plot uh, for Ken, no? Um... I believe we do. That's just because some of our ones that are more labor intensive, um, we try to keep at the MD, like at our plot site in Fort Kent. Um, so like say our quinoa trials that we have to scout four times a week, like the more ones that we have a lot of labor intensive right. work into, we try and keep it right close to us. So it incurs less expense. Yeah, no, that's good. That makes sense. Um, is there any other questions before I pass it on to Stephanie? I have one more question. Um, 
Amanda. Regarding some of your, your trials in the, uh, the top producing oats and barley, mm -hmm. do you know of any large acres that were seeded in within our municipalities? Um, so it depends on like municipalities. Like I know oats, a very common one, I would say across all four municipalities probably would be AC Morgan. Um, I know when I talk to lots of producers, that is one of the varieties that I hear quite often. Um, I've also heard of um, CS Camden, um, not as common as Morgan. Um, I would say Morgan is probably the most common oat variety um, within our municipalities. On the barley side of things, um, I would definitely say Ostensin is still probably one of the most commonly grown varieties of barley um, on the grain producing side of things. Um, also, AC Metcalf is a fairly popular one as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so with that, I'm going to pass it on to Stephanie. Okay, sorry. And where are you going to be growing that hemp at? Um, so our hemp, we are hoping to put that, um, if we do get accepted um, with the license, we are hoping to put that in the Smoky Lake County as that is, Smoky Lake and Lac La Biche are probably the two biggest hemp producing counties that we do have. Um, if we can put it in more places, we will. Um, but it just, it depends on if we get accepted for the hemp license, but Smoky Lake County is for sure one of the places we will be putting it. And I'll be talking with all of the um, egg fieldmen, um, just discussing all the trials. Good. But yeah, no, I also want to thank the egg fieldmen. So um, Keith, Matt, Janice, Amanda, Carly and Jacob, thank you guys so much. Um, I really appreciate working with you guys. Being fairly new in this position and working with you guys, it makes it a little bit easier to get to know your municipalities and your producers' needs. So I wanna also thank you guys as well. Okay, um, so if there's no more questions, I'm gonna pass it over to Stephanie. Just let me share my screen here. <coughs> Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, we can see it, Stephanie. Okay, perfect. So good evening, everyone. My name is Stephanie Billado. I'm the agronomy technician here at Lara. So I will be covering the forage and livestock portion of this presentation as this is my first year. Usually Alyssa covers this portion, so uh, bear with me. So I would just like to start this presentation off with providing you with a little bit of information about the forage trials that we participated in 2020. So we are participating in the regional silage trials. So um, this consisted of six different regional silage trials, which were replicated in Fort Kent, St. Paul, and one trial in Smoky Lake. All the trials were seeded in a randomized complete block design as Amanda um, described earlier, and so they were replicated four times. All the seeding dates and rates will be in the 2020 annual report booklet once we have it out to you guys. So all of our RST cereal trials fertilizer received a blend of 60, 30, 25, 10 at 125 pounds per acre, as Amanda mentioned earlier. And all of the silage trials were harvested with our um, forage harvester, as you've seen in the pictures at the beginning of the presentation. The cereal silage trials were all harvested at the soft dough stage. The pea cereal trials were harvested a week after the soft dough stage so that the pulses were mature enough to harvest. And then our alternative trials were silaged at the recommended cropping stage. So this is our RST barley. Um, that was in Fort Kent. So um, the three RST cereal varieties were all grown in Fort Kent and St. Paul are, are, sorry about that. Okay, so there are 14 varieties of barley at our Fort Kent and St. Paul site. So our Fort Kent site was harvested on August 14th. 2020, the overall average for the yield of the RST barley in Fort Kent was 3.42 tons per acre. The highest yielding variety was AB Advantage at 3.99 tons per acre. This is a newer variety and it has been pretty promising in this trial as you can see. 
looking at our uh, barley trial in St. Paul. This trial was harvested on August 17th. The overall average yield was 4.51 tons per acre, per acre, which was higher than the Fort Kent barley. Um, the highest yield variety was Sundry at 6.45 tons per acre. Um, this variety is a six-year-old barley, barley variety that has been around for over five years now. The second um, highest yielding barley was, or sorry, the um, AB Wrangler and AB Advantage yielded within the top four um, varieties within this trial. These varieties are a newer variety um, that were just recently re released in these um, previous years. Therefore, they could be promising for the future um, silage productions. Now we're gonna go into our oat silage trials. So there were 10 varieties of oats within this trial in Fort Kent and St. Paul. Um, our Fort Kent trial was harvested on August 18th of 2020. The overall average for this trial was 4.73 tons per acre. The highest yielding variety in this trial was CS Camden at 5.77 tons per acre. As you, we look at our St. Paul RST oats, um, this trial was harvested on August 20th of 2020. The overall average yield was 4.21 tons per acre, which was lower than our Fort Kent site, or than our trial in Fort Kent. The highest yielding variety was CDC Baylor at 4.84 tons per acre. This variety is a well-adapted forage variety that has one of the common forage varieties grown in this lakeland. Um, moving into our triticale slash wheat trials, this trial had five spring triticale varieties and five spring soft white wheat varieties, as well as a hard red. Um, it, this trial was harvested in Fort Kent on August 18th of 2020. Um, the average yield for Fort Kent was 4.6 tons per acre. The highest yielding variety was for triticale was Bunker at 6.09 tons per acre. The highest yielding soft white wheat variety was 4.38 tons per acre. Looking at our um, triticale and wheat variety, wheat in St. Paul. This trial was harvested on August 17th. The average yield for the trial for the St. Paul site was 3.39 tons per acre. Bunker again was the highest yielding triticale variety at 4.37 tons per acre. And for our soft white wheat, we had AC Andrew, which yielded at 3.64 tons per acre. This variety is a short um, high yielding variety with a strong straw. So it, is, um, it has a good lodging resistance to it. So we had this year, we had our RST winter spring cereal trial. So this trial was at our site in St. Paul and our Smoky Lake um, site as well. Our trial in Smoky Lake was unable to be harvested due to the high amounts of rainfall that we received. Therefore, declaring this county in an agriculture disaster. So no data was collected. So we will just be looking at the data for our St. Paul site. This trial had three winter cereal varieties that were used in mixtures with triticale, barley, and oat varieties. Um, for the winter cereals, there was AAC wildfire, a hard red winter wheat, Prima, a fall rye, and Luoma, which is a winter triticale, that were paired with um, Taza, which is a spring triticale, CDC Austinson, which is a, a barley variety, and CDC Bear, Bar, or Baylor, sorry, as an oat variety. So these uh, winter cereals were paired with the spring cereals and mixtures, as you can see in some of the treatments. But then we also, you also can see how there is um, these spring cereals which are alone in their own um, separate plots, which is 
allowing us to compare the data between the two, between the treatments. So our, our trial in St. Paul was harvested on September 8th, 8th of 2020. I'm looking at the graph, as you can see, the highest yielding treatment was Luoma with CDC Baylor at 4.77 tons per acre. The winter cereals, as you can see, um, the winter cereals that were paired with CDC Baylor actually yield, yielded in the top four of the trial. The trial's overall average yield was 4.08 tons per acre. With our RSTP cereal um, trials, this trial had 12 treatments, which included three common cereals used in forage production that were paired with two pea varieties and one Fabavine variety. This trial was at our Fort Kent and St. Paul sites. This year was the first year that they actually included a Fabavine variety called Snowbird, um, which has been, they've added this as it has been more calm, has it has become of like more interest in using this um, pulse for forage production. So Snowbird they chose as it is a zero tannin variety that has been that has a medium seed size and is a good source of protein and energy for livestock. So as you can see, looking at this graph for the Fort Kent site, this trial was harvested on September 1st of 2020. As you can see, Tazo yielded the highest at 4.81 tons per acre as your typical spring cereal. Now I'm looking at our pea cereal mixtures our CDC Austinson slash Snowbird yielded in the second highest at 4.46 tons per acre. The overall average for this trial for Kent was 3.99 tons per acre. Looking at our pea cereal site in St. Paul, this trial was harvested on September 8th of 2020. And looking at the data on this graph, as you can see, CDC Baylor was the highest yielding cereal at 5.41 tons per acre. Taza slash Snowbird was the highest yielding pea cereal mixture treatment at 5.37 tons per acre. Next, we'll, move, we'll be moving into our RST alternative trials that we had. So this, these trials had 10 different alternative cover crop species within the trial. We had this trial at both our Fort Kent site as well as this, our site in St. Paul. This trial compares using different alternative forage species for silage, green feed, and grazing production. As you can see in this trial, um, it was the highest yielding right, or alternative was the Japanese millet at 3.03 tons per acre. And I wanna mention that this trial was harvested in Fort Kent on September 4th of 2020. And the overall average for this trial um, Yeah, I seem to have forgot that. So we're just going to move on to our St. Paul site. Sorry about that. Um, so this site was harvested on September 8th. 2020, the highest yielding treatment for the St. Paul site was your forage, forage radish at 2.13 tons per acre. I just wanna mention that this um, hardy forage radish is actually drought tolerant and is easy for livestock to digest as it has a, and also it has a high amount of energy. Next, we'll be looking at our longevity longevity perennial forage trials that we have here at Lara. So these are trials were established in 2017. Um, with our legumes, we have 14 different perennial forage legume varieties. We have 12 perennial forage grasses varieties within the grasses trial, and we have nine mixtures or nine treatments of mixtures and legume grasses in that trial. 
So looking at the data we have here for our, um, our legumes, 20-10 yielded the highest at 3.48 tons per acre. Um, this overall average of the trial was 3.46 tons per acre. Looking at our grasses trial, this trial was harvested on July 21st of 2020. Our highest yielding um, grass variety was Success Hybrid Brome, which was the um, which yielded at 4.69 tons per acre. The overall average for this trial was at 3.22 tons per acre. And lastly, we'll be looking at our, our mixtures. So the highest yielding mixture was Success Hybrid Brome paired with Yellow Head, which is a legume which was treat in this treatment, which yielded at 5.4 tons per acre. The average yield throughout the trial was 4.5 tons per acre. And that's kind of what I all have for you guys for here tonight. Um, overall, it was definitely a difficult um, silaging season as we were dealing with um, high amounts of moisture. So it was definitely difficult trying to get our trial seated in at the right timing, as well as um, they were a bit delayed with their maturity, but overall we were able to harvest all of our trials. So with that, I will, I guess if anyone has any questions for me, I will open the floor for questions. Hi, Stephanie, Charlie here. Hi. Um, do you do a feed analysis on any of the forage trials? Yes. Like for example, okay. So like for example, in the silage trials, mm -hmm. do you do a feed analysis on the individual, um, on the individual uh, varieties or on combination, combination of crops? How, how does that work exactly? So yeah, with our, for, with our silage trials, we do forage sample all of our um, trials, or sorry, all of like our varieties. So within our barley trial, for instance, we do do like a individual forage analysis on each variety. So that all of that information will be included like within our annual report. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, um, any other questions? I have a question, uh, Stephanie, it's Mark. Uh, you talked about fertilizing, I think, at 120 pounds per acre, and I think so did Amanda. Is, yeah. that, is that happening on every plot and, and regardless of, of where, uh, which municipality, or do you mess around with, uh, with fertilizer at all? So I could maybe answer that question, Mark. Um, so we do soil sample each of our plot sites within our municipalities. We do soil sample our plot sites. Um, so we do base our fertilizer rates on that. Um, so this year, our Fort Kent and our um, Malagar St. Paul site were fairly close. So we didn't change our, um, our fertilizer rates for that. Um, but we do like when we look at it, so Lac La Biche, there was, um, we needed more nitrogen on our Lac La Biche site. So we do change our rates for that. But yeah we go off of like what our nutrients need is in our municipalities is how it works. We base our fertilizer off of that. Okay, and do you have a, a cost per acre uh, as far as fertilizer goes? You know that? Um, I'd have to look into that. I'd have to break it down per right. plot. Okay. Uh, any other questions? So, so uh, yes, Charlie again. Um, have you done any uh, sampling in this fall for fertilizer? Um, no, we usually try to do it first thing in the spring as there can be quite a bit of nutrient loss um, throughout the winter. Um, so we try to do it in the spring so we can get a more accurate look at what our nutrient need actually is. What, as, as to what's required. So, so this last year, because of all the moisture, uh, we may be looking at uh, using more fertilizer then for this year because yeah, of the 
probably because of the leaching. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, sure. yeah, okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, with that, I will pass it over to Kelly and she will take care of the, she will go on with the environmental program side of this presentation. Okay. So I'm gonna start, uh, first start talking a little bit about the environmental farm plan. Uh, this program is still up and running. Um, I know a lot of people have contacted me uh, concerned that it was regarding, uh, tied to the Canadian Agricultural Partnerships funding. However, they are independent programs. Alberta EFP has continued to be developed uh, and delivered. Um, some of the developments that are happening is that there's going to be a habitat management chapter uh, being added probably by the end of this, um, this coming year, um, as well as they're working towards an Alberta EFP plus program. So currently right now it's a 10 year renewal for any Alberta EFPs. Um, different sectors are pushing for the Alberta EFP plus, which is a verified version of it. And for that, it would be a three year renewal if anybody chooses to take part in the Alberta EFP plus program. Uh, the reasons to complete an EFP is it can reduce costs and increase profit. It gives you a really good um, idea of what's happening on your operation. Um, it is a self-assessment tool, so it is personal and private. Um, it's really just between you and me. Um, I'm the one who comes out to deliver the, the EFP program, and so it doesn't ever leave, um, leave the farm. Um, it can be a requirement for the funding, so it is tied to the CAP funding for producers for the Environmental Stewardship and Climate Change Program. Uh, although they're not taking uh, any applications at the moment, I would expect that this program will reopen sometimes during the next couple months for sure. Um, it can improve access to markets, especially if it does move to an EFP plus verified program. Um, so it kind of meets the global standards for sustainable sourcing. Um, it is really a good tool for succession planning, um, for handing down the farm, for having a really good assessment of where everything is on the operation and really opens up that conversation piece between the two. Um, I still do riparian health assessments. I did a few over the summertime. It is a very COVID friendly um, activity. Uh, riparian areas are important to, um, for a lot of varieties of reasons, a lot of ec ecological goods and services come out of them. Um, it improves water quality. It helps prevent erosion. Um, it's a good primary production, not only for your operation, but also for all the wildlife that comes and utilizes those areas, uh, recharges groundwater, um, as well as can provide a water source for your operation, um, which ties into the Lara RAP program. It was talked about a little bit in the financials. So the Lara RAP program is a watershed resiliency and restoration program. Uh, we did, uh, Lara received, a did an application through Alberta Environment. We did receive $290,000 over the course of the entire project, of which pretty close to about 85% of it went to producer programs themselves for funding a whole host of different um, projects such as offsite watering systems, riparian fencing, uh, watercourse crossings, and wetland enha enhancements, which include pond levelers and beaver control. Um, or beaver um, coexistence tools, I should say. Uh, we also did help fund one wintering site relocation that was within a creek uh, to move to an upland location. Um, so the, these are numbers that um, are as of December of 2020. Um, so we funded 16 offsite watering systems. We did 14.15 miles of riparian fencing. Um, we did three watercourse crossings. So these were um, bridges of various sorts. Um, uh, producers sometimes chose rig mats, sometimes chose to do a high boy across the water. Um, it was very producer dependent. Um, and we also did two pond levelers as well as um, we did a training session with a whole host of um, different municipalities that came to it. So we did actually a third one, um, but uh, for a producer. Um, just coming up, we are still hoping to host the Soil Health Academy 
uh, this coming summer is going to be in person. We can take 60 producers for it. Um, it's very exciting. It's with Gabe Brown, Ray Archuleta, Shane New, and Dr. Allen Williams. It's July 19th to 21st. It's going to be three very intensive days of part classroom, part out in the field um, experiences. Um, I think everybody always enjoys listening to Gabe Brown. Um, I really enjoy also Ray Archuleta. We did have them for webinars this year. Uh, we did have over 100 people for each of the webinars that we hosted with Gabe Brown, Ray Archuleta, and Dr. Alan Williams each. And since then, there's been over 1,000 hits per webinar um, on our YouTube channel. So if you didn't know that Lara had a YouTube channel, now is a great time to come check it out. We do have recordings of most of the webinars that we host. Um, so that way, if you miss anything or just want to rewatch it, they are available. 